Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and get started. So, um, is he gone? Is Fruman gone? The Furminator will not be showing up anymore until the very last day when we'll all get together and we'll have a little review session. In the meantime, we can talk freely amongst ourselves. So, he's gone. Anyways, so the last time uh, that I was talking with you guys, last Wednesday, we, we were talking about T-cell development and this whole process of how the T-cell decides Number one, whether it's going to be able to bind to MHC. And then number two, whether it's going to be able to bind to our own peptides, our own uh, self-peptides, which of course, as we learned, there's that process of negative selection that makes sure that T cells are not overtly autoreactive. So now we're going to talk, we're going to turn our attention to T cell mediated immunity and this idea that you know, the immune system recognizes these, these peptides and T cells then can recognize in, in the periphery uh, potential infections, tumor cells, that sort of thing, and then have, bring a, a, an immune response to bear against that. And so the next two lectures, we'll talk about how T cells can control uh, these sorts of reactions. So today, we're going to focus our attention uh, initially on essentially where the T cells are recognizing these antigens. So where do we have an adaptive or acquired immune response? And so we'll talk about where the T cells are in the periphery, and then um, the, the particular antigen presenting cells and how those antigen presenting cells detect that antigen. They, they detect an infection uh, using their innate immune signaling mechanisms and then make their way uh, to interact with the T cell at a nearby lymph node. And then we'll talk about how the T cell actually, uh, once that antigen presenting cell makes its way to the site of where the T cells are, how those interactions take place and what stabilizes those interactions. And then we'll talk uh, a little bit today, and we'll, we'll spend more time talking the next time about T cell activation and some of the different um, uh, things that are taking place with that. We'll spend some time talking about these professional antigen presenting cells and, and the different subtypes that are involved. And then we'll briefly consider what we call adjuvants, these signals that activate the innate immune system and how there's that crosstalk between uh, innate immune cells and uh, T cells. And at the very end, we'll talk about the immune synapse, which is basically a, a signaling platform that these T cells use to become activated. Okay, so let's first consider just overall perspective about T cell mediated immunity. And one of the th points to note, as, as we'll learn today, is that the acquired immune response, whether we're talking about B cells or T cells, really doesn't occur at the site of infection. So when we think about where you know, there might be an infection, let's say the flu virus gets into our lungs, uh, T cells are not initially activated in that context. They need to become activated by antigen presenting cells. And as we'll learn, those antigen presenting cells themselves can detect this, mic this microbial infection. And as a result, they become mature, they make their way to the site of a nearby lymph node, and it's there where they interact with naive T cells. And again, remembering that naive T cells uh, are activated by antigens and not by these molecular patterns or these PAMPs that you guys have learned about. Uh, they need to be able to, to recognize that particular microbial peptide for which their T cell receptor is specific. So this, uh, th these sorts of uh, interactions between these, these innate immune cells like dendritic cells and macrophages take place um, inside the, the target organ itself where you might have an infection going on but they then migrate to a nearby lymph node and examples of what we would call secondary lymphoid tissue. So the last couple of lectures that I gave to you guys, we were talking about primary, a primary lymphoid tissue, which is the thymus. Okay, so for T cells, when we think about a primary lymphoid tissue, we're talking about the thymus, the bone marrow, which is where B cells also develop. And so those are you know, primary lymphoid organs. Secondary lymphoid organs are essentially you know, lymph nodes. So examples of those are, are pyrus patches, and we'll talk about those in, in gory detail uh, in a couple of lectures. In the tonsils, and you guys have probably all had swollen tonsils at some point, your mom came over and said, oh, you've got swollen tonsils, you're not going to school today. So you should know what those are. Those are lymph nodes that are here in your, um, in your throat. Uh, as well as the spleen, which sometimes we want to vent that, but that's a place where we have uh, a lot of T cells and B cells, and it's really there inside of our gut to help assist with some of the immune uh, responses that are taking place there. And then, of course, our lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are throughout the body, and you don't normally recognize them unless you have some sort of an infection going on in a, in a peripheral site. But one of the key points that I want to make about these uh, is that 
An antigen, it needs to make its way into a lymphoid tissue in order to be presented to a T cell. And that is taken, that's taking place through these antigen presenting cells, which can then migrate and then induce an acquired or adaptive immune response that depends on these T cells and B cells. And once that takes place, then these lymphocytes can then migrate out to the site of where the infection is taking place and do their what we call effector function. So we'll spend a little bit more time in the next lecture talking about what we call uh, effector T cells. But the point of that is that you initially have to have this process of clonal expansion. And you guys have heard the, the term clonal expansion before. It's the idea that you know, because of this random generation of these antigen receptors, you have very, very few precursors, very, very few cells, whether it be a T cell or a B cell, that's specific for a particular antigen. And you need to have some mechanism to be able to expand that so that you can then deal with a particular uh, microbial infection or a tumor. And that process is really all taking place inside of these, these lymph nodes, okay, these secondary lymphoid tissues. Finally, they make their way out of that lymphoid tissue into the site of the infection. So they kind of follow a little chemotactic gradient back to the site of that infection where they can then bring about their, their effector function and hopefully be able to eliminate uh, that particular uh, infection. All right, so I, I'm just showing an example of this. Uh, let's say that you got a little crazy and you know, before Thanksgiving you decided to freak your parents out and you got a foot piercing. So this is uh, an example of where you've punctured the skin here and of course, you know, generally speaking, most people's feet are kind of dirty because they're their feet. And uh, so the result of that is that there's a lot of gunk here, a lot of bacteria, fungus, and so forth. And by you know permeating the skin, we, we can think of the skin as essentially the first barrier of infection. It's it's a layer that prevents any sort of microbes from getting in. But of course, if you get this this sort of puncture in the skin, then that opens the inside of our bodies up to these these kind of infections. And so within the skin, you, you can see that there's some of these bacteria that are starting to make their way inside of the dermis here. And, and throughout the, the skin, there are specialized cells like mac macrophages and dendritic cells. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about dendritic cells today. But basically those cells have these specialized pattern recognition receptors. And so their role is essentially to, to determine whether there's some sort of a microbe that's present uh, in, that, in that environment. And so once they do, they then make their way into the lymphatic system where they then traffic towards a nearby lymph node. And so the lymph node shown here is uh, up along the, um, near the knee. So they make their way through the lymphatic, come here. And this is the site of a lot of naive T cells. So you've got a lot of T cells that have all these different specificities. And of course, we need to find the right T cell. And so there's a, you know, as we'll talk about today, there's a whole process whereby these T cells that have a very, very low specificity. There are very few of these precursors that can recognize that particular uh, bacterium, but they need to be able to, to do so. They need to recognize it, and the, the appropriate T cell or T cells that are present in this lymph node need to become activated uh, and then undergo clonal expansion and then be able to respond by making their way back out of this lymph node and then traverse back down to the site of this, um, uh, this injury. So what are the, the routes of antigen presentation? You guys have heard a little bit about antigen presentation before when you were Dr. Freeman was talking about MHC class one and MHC class two antigen presentation. And so you know that MHC class one, the, the source of antigen is usually from where? Sorry? From within the cell. And what about the class two pathway? From outside the cell, right. So, we generally think of that as, you know, sort of the, but I'll show you an example of where that doesn't always take place. But obviously these antigens, these peptide antigens need to be routed into these, these MHC pathways in order to be able to be presented to these T cells. And so today we're gonna to be talking about these uh, specialized antigen presenting cells called dendritic cells. And they call them that because they have these little dendrites that, that uh, hang out and they sort of look a little, you know, when we think about dendrites, we think of typically from the, the brain, but in this case, these are, these are innate immune cells. And what they do is they're really good at engulfing, you know, bacteria, picking up antigen, protein antigen, and so forth, and then chewing that up and then putting that out onto the surface of the cell in the context of, of MHC. So an example of that is shown here where, let's say that you have a extracellular bacterium. This could be the one that came in through your, you know, the, the cut in your foot. And so this dendritic cell has uh, specialized receptors on the surface. This could be something, as we'll talk about later, like DEC-205. Uh, 
that can bind to this bacterium. And the result of that is that through receptor-mediated endocytosis, it makes its way inside of the cell uh, into, these, into an endosome. And then it ultimately gets um, linked up into the class two pathway. So this gets chewed up into small peptides, put onto the surface of MHC class two, and then delivered to the surface of that dendritic cell where it can then be presented to CD4 T cells, which will then, as, as naive cells, if they recognize that peptide, they will undergo clonal expansion and then uh, differentiate and then make their way out into the periphery. So another example would be uh, macropenocytosis, where these are taken up not through receptor-mediated endocytosis, but rather sort of a non-specific fashion. And, and as I said, these dendritic cells are really good at, at picking up things, just as are macrophages. And so this could be um, extracellular bacteria, um, soluble antigens, virus particles, uh, and so forth that are taken up into this uh, uh, vesicle, processed, put onto the surface of the cell in the context of MHC class two, and again, activating these CD4 cells. On the other hand, you may have, say, a, a virus that comes along. And if this virus gets inside of this dendritic cell, it can infect the cell and then start to replicate. And so the result of that is that some of those virus uh, proteins will be produced inside the cell, make their way into the class one pathway through the, um, from the cytosol into the ER and, and so forth through the secretory pathway, making their way to vesicles inside the cell that have MHC class one. And so in this case, MHC class one makes its way onto the surface of the cell. Uh, those viral peptides are associated with class one, and so that then becomes presented to naive CD8 T cells, and if the appropriate T cell comes along, it can then become activated, uh, expand, and then uh, exit the periphery to find that, uh, that virus infection. Now there's an, kind of an unusual situation here which is called cross-presentation. And let's say that we have a virus uh, in this case which is uh, extracellular. So let's say it's taken up just as we've talked about uh, in this case here, it's taken up by macropenocytosis. Now, typically we would think about that as going into the class two pathway because that's, you know, the, the rule, right? If it's coming from the outside, it goes to class two. If it's from the inside, it goes through class one. But in this case, this something called cross-presentation where there's a little bit of leakiness in these pathways. So class one uh, sometimes can get loaded up with antigens that come from the outside, which is basically shown in this case. So these uh, virions have been taken up into the cell broken down into these peptides and then make their way into the class one peptide, uh, class one pathway, present those antigens to CD8 cells. And then finally, uh, you can have some dendritic cells that can traffic their way uh, into the lymph node, present those antigens, in this case these could be virions or they could be peptide antigens, um, make their way inside of another dendritic cell and you get presentation in this class one pathway. So. There's a variety of different ways in which these antigens can make their way um, into these antigen-presenting cells, and they can, uh, they can then prime a T cell response. So the real question is, you know, we know that these different antigens can get processed and presented either by class one or class two. How are they accomplishing this? I mean, how does the immune system actually recognize that these are microbes, and how do these, these antigens make their way to a to a lymph node where they can then be encountered by uh, the resident T cell populations. So uh, this is a, a, just a figure from your text where it basically shows that you have T cells that are essentially circulating all the time. When we think about T cells and we think about secondary uh, lymphoid tissues, there's sort of a, a thought that, well, these are just little bags of T cells. You know, there's some B cells there in the B cell zones and then there's T cells and they just kind of hang out in those places and that's where they, they go. But in fact, these lymphocytes, both T cells and B cells, are, are constantly traversing our bodies through the lymphatic system and through our bloodstream, making their way from one lymph, lymph node to the next, unless they become activated, at which point then they start to, to divide and then make their way out to the site of a particular infection. So the naive cells enter into the lymph nodes, uh, and an example of this is through what are called high endothelial venules. So endothelial cells are simply the, the lining on the inside of our are blood vessels, and basically what happens is that you have this constant circulation of these T cells from the blood through these high endothelial venules uh, into the lymph node, and then if they don't recognize anything, they get then shunted back out into the bloodstream or, or into the lymphatic system. 
All right, so that's shown here where you have these T cells that are coming along. They recognize uh, from within the, the, um, the blood, they make their way through these high endothelial venules and then start to enter into the cortex of this lymph node. And so the consequence of that is then it, they can then interact with uh, dendritic cells. And some of these dendritic cells may be expressing a particular antigen. And so they're, they're basically constantly looking for antigen. They're very modal. They're not just sitting there like is this bag of cells, but instead they're traversing, moving around very quickly throughout this lymph node. And I'll show you an example of that uh, in a minute. But basically they're bopping around looking for a dendritic cell that has the appropriate antigen that can then be recognized by their T cell receptor. So if they don't encounter that antigen, then the result is that they then uh, leave the, the uh, lymph node through the lymphatic system. They go through what are called efferent lymphatics, as I'll show in a minute. And then ones that do encounter antigen basically stick around for a few days. And what they do is then start to undergo clonal expansion. They start to uh, quickly divide. And so the result of that is that you know, once the, um, this clonal expansion, expansion has taken place, there's roughly about a million fold expansion over a few days. And so then the result is that those cells can then migrate back out, follow a chemokine gradient to the site of the infection and then be able to bring to bear their effector function. All right, so now one of the issues with this is that if, if you look at the precursor frequency, the, the number of T cells, let's say that's you know, specific for a t particular type of microbe, like let's say a flu infection, the, the precursor frequency is something like one in 10 to the four to one in 10 to the six. So there's essentially very, very few T cells that are specific for one particular uh, pathogen. And so the consequence of this is that by, by basically bringing together the players here, the, the dendritic cells or macrophages that are presenting this, this antigen into the lymph nodes where you've concentrated these T cells, you basically enhance the chance of these T cells uh, being able to interact with a particular uh, antigen, okay? And, and the other point of this is that you know, again, this is not essentially random. It's not just taking place in the sort of the big bag of our bodies, but it's, it's being concentrated and being driven by um, the different sorts of, of molecules that, that get those T cells to the right place. All right, so this is being regulated by what are called chemokines, and I think you, you guys have heard chemokines before in this class. So chemokines are basically chemotactic proteins, and they um, bind, they, they are, several different types of them. One example of this is what's called uh, CCR7, which is a CC type chemokine, and or a chemokine receptor, I should say. And this is expressed on these naive T cells. And within these lymph nodes, especially in these areas where these high endothelial venules are, there are chemokine ligands. These are the actual chemokines themselves, such as CCL19 and CCL21. And these are basically being produced by dendritic cells inside of the lymph nodes as well as in the stromal cells. And those serve as a signal to tell these T cells they need to come into the um, high endothelial venules. That's a, a signal that basically lets those cells know where they need to go. Uh, on the other hand, there's a molecule called L-selectin, and I'll show you this in the next slide, which is also expressed on these naive T cells. And it binds to what are called uh, cell cellular addressins. So when we think of a, an addressin, unlike a chemokine, which sets up a chemotactic gradient, these addressins are molecules that are sort of like the address you have on the outside of your, your, your house. You know, it says, this is where I want my mail delivered. Well, in this case, it's saying, this is where I want the T cells to be delivered. And those T cells can then uh, know that they're supposed to go into the, um, the lymph node through these uh, HEV um, cells. Okay, any, any questions about that? Yeah? So uh, the maturation of, or production of T cells occurs in the thymus, which then those T cells get to the system. So the question is the, the development of the T cells is taking place within the thymus. That's where the T cell receptor is first rearranged. It's for, where it's tested first to make sure it's going to bind properly and not over, you know, too much avidity. And then those T cells then need to make their way out into the periphery where they then are going to go on into these secondary lymphoid tissues like, you know, lymph nodes and pyrus patches and so forth. And that's, and it's really, you know, within the thymus, you don't have a whole lot of, of you know, microbial antigen presentation. That's all going to be taking place in the context of these, of the lymph nodes. Does that answer the question? Well, just make clarification. That clarification noted. Any other questions? All right.
So as a consequence of, of these addressins, then the T cell needs to actually make its way inside of, the, inside of these lymph nodes. And, and in order to do so, it has to undergo something that we call extravasation, which is basically it needs to get from the lumen of these, uh, from the bloodstream, within the cortex of, of the lymph node. And so how does it do that? Well, this is an, a, an example of where a T cell, and I'll show you a movie on this in a minute, but basically what happens is that T cells are, are just cruising along through the bloodstream and then they enter into these areas uh, where there are these high endothelial venules. So these cells that have on their surface, number one, they have a chemokine, uh, basically tells the cell that it's going to the right place. They also have these addressins like glycam 1 and CD34 on the surface. And so here's a, a naive T cell making its way through the, the, the blood uh, and then it recognizes that. And so one of the things that happens is that on, on its surface, it has this molecule L-selectin which is uh, basically it's a lectin. It's, it's a glycoprotein that has uh, sugars on the surface that allow it to interact very specifically with this other lectin um, on, on the surface of these HEV cells. So the consequence of that is that it starts to slow the cells down. Instead of just traversing through at the speed of blood, they start to hit these, these uh, membranes and they start to slow down. And so the consequence of that is that then allows the T cell to be able to bind to some of these chemokines. And I, I was mentioning before that within these uh, high endothelial venules, you have a lot of expression of these chemokines, which are chemoattractants for these T cells. So the consequence of that is that on the surface of this naive T cell, it has this CCR7, this receptor for this chemokine. And so the result of, of this interaction, so the chemokine binds to the receptor, that sends an intracellular signal to a molecule called LFA, which is a, uh, what we call an adhesion molecule. And that then increases the ability of LFA to interact with this molecule called I ICAM-1. So the consequence of this is that over time, as these cells are really just rolling along these high endothelial venules, they, they start to slow down. These T cells start to slow down to the point where they actually stop and that, that stopping then allows something called diapedesis. And diapedesis is basically where the T cell needs to make its way across this high endothelial venule inside the lumen of the, the lymph node. Okay, so to, so to do that, it starts to break down tight junctions that are pulling these HEV cells together, and then ultimately makes its way inside the, the cortex of this lymph node. So I wanted to show an example of this um, on YouTube. Expresses selectin molecules, P-selectin and E-selectin. Blood vessel endothelium at sites of infection expresses selectin molecules, P-selectin and E-selectin. Leukocytes, such as neutrophils, express the ligand for selectins in the form of the sialylated Lewis X carbohydrate, s -lex. The binding of the endothelial selectins to s -lex is weak and cannot hold the cell against the flow of blood. Instead, the cell rolls along the wall of the blood vessel, making and breaking many interactions with the selectins. That's not the movie I wanted, but whatever, it's close enough. So they're, they're rolling along. The next step is that once they, they slow down through those ICAM LFA interactions, that basically stabilizes that interaction with the, the high endothelial venules, and then they can then make their way inside of the um, inside of the, uh, the lymph node. Any questions about extravasation? Yeah, back there. And the video was about the neutrophil. What's the big difference between the, when the neutrophil grows along the tissue and here and there? Uh, they're very similar in terms of how they make their way inside of the, the um, the lymph nodes, the molecules are a little bit different, but the, you know, I'll, I'll upload the proper movie later. I just don't want to search for it right now, okay. but I'll put it on the website. You guys all know that on the website, I've got all the, the movies that I show during the lectures. You can, down, you can go there and you can visit those online. Also, I wanted to point out, I, I uh, I've now have put up new chapters for the message board. You guys, anybody using the message board here? <laughs> 
So that, I think it's a good way to get up on, you know, if you can't make it to my, my office hours or something like that, you know, feel free to post the questions on the message board and I'd be more than happy to answer those. And, and you know, if you're, um, if, if you know the answer to a question, give it a shot. I'm always checking them, make sure they're right. But, but I've looked at some of the questions that people have uh, posted and then some of the answers. And actually we had one on chapter seven about negative selection and positive selection. And the person who answered it was, was exactly right. So whoever that was, can, you know, good job. So, but, but that's a great way to really kind of keep up to speed on uh, you know, some of the questions that are, are troubling certain people in the class. And you know, just a great way to kind of kind of keep in contact. And I can't say that I, I'm gonna be monitoring that 24 hours a day, but I, I'll certainly try to, uh, to log on to that frequently. Any other questions about extravasation? All right. So when we think about it, basically what we have here is, as I mentioned, on, on the skin, or this could be in the lungs or what have you, you have uh, some kind of microbe coming along resulting in uh, you know, the, the, some sort of infected tissue. And so then the, you have these dendritic cells and macrophages that are, are present within that site, within that tissue, and they can then make their way inside of the lymphatics. In this case, what we call the afferent lymphatic, which is taking these cells, these dendritic cells, into the cortex of this lymph node. And then you have T cells that are making their way throughout the, through the blood into the high endothelial venules where they can then undergo this process of rolling you know, in, in response to both these vascular addressins, like we talked about, CD34, et cetera, that then causes those T cells to slow down. They start to roll along, eventually stop, upregulate LFA, interact with ICAM, and then undergo diapedesis so that they are now present within the, uh, the cortex of this lymph node. And so the T cells can either interact here with T cells or with uh, dendritic cells that are present, they can also make their way throughout the lymphatic system to encounter dendritic cells and other antigen presenting cells in, in nearby lymph nodes. And so the consequence of this then is that if the T cell recognizes the appropriate antigen, it undergoes clonal expansion and then can go out through the efferent lymphatics. So the efferent lymphatics is where these guys will uh, be released and they can then ultimately make their way back out to the tissue where they can then bring to bear their effector function. So what happens when, once the T cell makes its way into the lymph node? Um, you know, as I mentioned, T cells are, are making their way throughout the, these different uh, lymph nodes. They're not just static, they're not stuck in, in, as a ball of cells, they're making their way. But once they get there, then they need to make these interactions with antigen presenting cells. And they're doing so perpetually. They're doing this rapidly and, and all the time. And I'll show you in a, a movie of this in a minute. But, but what, what happens that allows that to take place? Well, on the surface of the antigen presenting cell, as well as on the T cell, there are these adhesion molecules. And you know, I just talked about LFA and its ability to interact with ICAM-1. But these adhesion molecules, they're basically like glue, right? Or, or Velcro, we can think about it as like Velcro. So the T cell comes along and then there's this little interaction with Velcro and so the T cell kind of stays stuck there and that allows the T cell to sample the surface of that antigen presenting cell, use its T cell receptor, and if it recognizes the, the antigen that's presented by this antigen presenting cell, the result of that is that you get a productive activation. The T cell receptor becomes cross-linked. You get signaling taking place inside of that T cell and that then allows the, the T cell to uh, undergo clonal expansion, effector differentiation, and, and so forth, and then ultimately make its way out. All right, so, but one of the things that we know is that that LFA is really important, that LFA ICAM interaction is important for stabilizing that interaction. So that basically keeps uh, those T cells in the right place. And one of the things that we know that, that turns that Velcro into super glue, right? So if you think about it, the T cell needs to make that interaction, sample the surface, see if it's the right if it's the right antigen that its T cell receptor can bind. And if it doesn't have the right antigen, it doesn't make any sense for it to stay stuck on that antigen presenting cell anymore. It needs to move on and continue sampling different antigen presenting cells. You know, for example, dendritic cells that may have come in from, you know, from the skin or something like that in order to be able to become activated. And again, this is kind of the issue with the fact that there's such a, a small precursor frequency, the small number of cells that have the ability to, to recognize a particular 
antigen presented by an APC. So, uh, you know, you need to have that sort of on off. It needs to come in, sample the surface, be stuck there long enough to be able to see whether it's the right antigen. And then if it's not, then it needs to go on and do this with another cell, sort of this little dance that, it, that they're, they're, they're doing. But if it does find the appropriate antigen, so if you get a tight binding between the T cell receptor uh, and MHC plus peptide, in this case, unlike the situation for development of T cells where tight interactions are gonna induce apoptosis, here the T cell knows this is, a, this is an antigen it needs to recognize. And so the result of that is that it sends a signal to LFA that increases that binding to ICAM, just like it is for that process of diapedesis, that's also true to stabilize this interaction between the T cell receptor and its antigen presenting cell. So why does it need to do that? What's the, the purpose of that? It needs to do that because it needs, it knows that it's got the right antigen at this point and it needs to have enough signaling to be able to start that whole process of cell cycle induction, uh, this process of, of changes in global gene expression that allow it to go from that process of naive state to what we call the activated state. And once it becomes activated, then it can undergo that process of clonal expansion. All right, a any questions about that? Okay, so let's take a look at a movie on this. And what this is basically showing uh, is actually a, inside of a mouse, Those little guys, the, the red guys are antigen specific T cells and then there's some green cells here that are moving around as well. And basically what this is showing is, you know, what I, the point that I'm trying to make, which is that, um, you know, massage, lymphatic drainage, myth, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love you too, huh? All right, so, but what you can see is these, these T cells that are cruising along and sampling the surface of these different antigen presenting cells. Every once in a while you'll see one that will stop and it'll kind of like this guy here and then it will continue, now let's try that again. But if you kind of follow them, you can see that, you know, these little guys will, will get stuck and then they'll, they'll move on. And actually this, this kind of work, so first of all, it tells us that this process of T cells moving around and sampling the environment is pretty dynamic. There's, this is happening very quickly. That's not, you know, that's not real time, it's, it's sped up, but it's still, there's a lot of movement taking place. And I'm, uh, yeah, this is the fun stuff here, YouTube. I gotta be careful with that. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so they're moving around all the time. That technology was developed here at UCI. So there's a fellow by the name of Michael Cahalan who uh, recently uh, was inducted into the National, um, uh, into the, the National Academy of Sciences for the work that, that I was showing here, as well as work on, on how T cells become activated. But it's very important because it tells us, you know, this process of, of T cells recognizing uh, different antigen presenting cells is, is very dynamic. And it, again, it really very much depends on, on not only the T cell receptor binding to MHC, but also these adhesion molecules, which really dictate how long those T cells are gonna stick around. Okay, so any, any questions about T cell antigen presenting cell interactions? Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about T cell activation. We're gonna, we're gonna spend more time on this the next time, but there's a couple of points that I really wanna stress with this. And, and one of these is this issue of tolerance. We talked about self-tolerance a lot in the last, um, the last lecture. And in particular, this idea that you wanna have a T cell receptor, which is not gonna bind uh, with very high avidity to MHC plus peptide, because if it does so, then presumably you're gonna have a self response. At least that's the case in the thymus. Obviously once we get out into the periphery, we've already gotten rid of most of the T cells that are overtly autoreactive, and so we should be good, right? We should have, uh, all our T cells should be self tolerant. But that's not always the case, and I'll show you some examples of that later in the lecture, how this can, um, this doesn't always work. So it, it turns out that the T cell is not simply sampling this antigen presenting cell for, for peptide and MHC, but it's also sampling it for uh, what are called costimulatory ligands. And in this case, this costimulatory ligand is called B7, which is presented on the surface of this dendritic cell. In particular, after that dendritic cell has seen 
microbial infection. So uh, this is what we would call a mature dendritic cell, and I'll come back to this point in a minute. But basically, we know that both of those signals, both the TCR uh, MHC plus peptide signal, which we call signal one, is important. But in order for a naive T cell to be become productively activated in the periphery, it also requires this co-stimulatory signal through uh, its receptor on the surface called CD28. So if it doesn't get that signal, this T cell will not proliferate. And it gets that signal by binding to this B7 molecule. So what is the purpose of this co-stimulatory interaction? Well, basically for a, let me go back to this. So if a dendritic cell has, is basically sitting out in the periphery, and let's say it just happens to accidentally make its way into a lymph node and to encounter a T cell, um, it's gonna be presenting certain peptides. They could be you know, bacterial peptides, uh, they could be self-peptides. Most of the time, these are gonna be self-peptides. But if it's never seen a microbe, you know, through its, its pattern recognition receptors that recognize things like LPS and so forth, it's what we would call an immature antigen-presenting cell, meaning that it's, it's an antigen-presenting cell, it's a professional antigen-presenting cell, which means that it's, that's one of its major functions, but it's not been activated. It hasn't seen some innate immune stimulus, and so the result is that while it may be able to present peptides to T cells, it's not gonna productively activate that T cell because you need that signal coming in from the innate immune system, which is essentially crosstalk. So that crosstalk tells the immune system, tells the T cell that not only is this a, a peptide that, I, that you can recognize, but on top of that, this is a peptide that has come from the context of some sort of a uh, innate or microbial infection. And both of those signals are, are required for the T cell to become activated. So basically one of the questions is, so you have this signal, that signal is now being presented in the context of essentially innate immune signaling, so there's some sort of an infection going on. Um, what is, what's regulating these T cells? What regulates their proliferation? So number one, as I mentioned, you have to have that, not just the antigen receptor binding to the peptide, this antigenic peptide, but you also have to have its co-stimulatory receptor, CD28, binding to B7 presented on the surface of this antigen presenting cell. And if it doesn't do that, it doesn't get the signal that causes it to proliferate, and you don't get an immune response, okay? So why is that? So the first question, you know, why would you require this other signal other than the antigen? So any, any thoughts on that? Regulation, Regulation okay. Preventing a false positive. Pre preventing a false positive. So the idea is that you don't want to set up a response unless you know there's something bad going on. And, and when we talk about things going bad, you guys have learned about innate immune signaling through these toll-like receptors and you know, they recognize PAMPs, these pattern-associated molecular patterns. That's also true for uh, damage. We, we call these damps. Basically, if you have cells that are undergoing a lot of stress, they can produce um, molecules that will also activate the innate immune system. So it basically ensures that the immune response is, is gonna be brought to bear not simply against antigens, but antigens in, in the context of something bad going on, an infection, a tumor, tissue damage, what have you. Okay, so that's, that's ensuring that that's taking place. Now the second thing, in addition to these, these um, co-stimulatory ligands like B7 and uh, binding to CD28, there are also uh, other inhibitory molecules that can bind to CD28. And an example of that, or to, to B7 I should say, an example of that is a molecule that looks like CD28. This is expressed on the surface of a T cell and it's called CTLA-4. And I have to apologize for the hieroglyphics here, I think there's some um, computer issue between Mac and PC. But anyways, that says CTLA-4, CD152, and that is expressed on the surface of activated T cells. So naive T cells have on their surface CD28, but then B7, CD28 interactions cause those T cells to start to proliferate, and then you get this upregulation of, of CTLA-4, and CTLA-4 has a much stronger affinity for B7 molecules than CD28. So it binds roughly about 20-fold 20, 20 more efficiently than CD28. And so the result of those interactions is that as opposed to being stimulatory, they're actually inhibitory. So when, when CTLA-4 on the surface of a T cell binds to B7, that sends a signal into an activated T cell that tells it it should stop proliferating. It shouldn't continue along. And so the purpose of that is really to control um, 
kind of control and restrict T cell proliferation so it doesn't go crazy and the cells don't continue to get those signals. Why would a T cell want to not keep getting signals to cause it to become activated? Any thoughts? Yeah. Mutations could change the TCR. Mutations could change the TCR. I think it's possible. Any other thoughts? Could require a lot of resources to keep the T cell proliferating. That's that's reasonable. What about if the antigen never goes away, right? So what happens if the immune system, even though there's this process of, you know, tolerance that we talked about in the thymus, there's also, you know, you have to remember that the T cell receptor is just binding to a peptide. It's not a huge amount of information. Okay, so it, it's it makes mistakes, and those mistakes can lead to they can be deadly. They can cause an autoimmune response that could kill the host. And if you think about it, self antigens are the kinds of antigens that you could never get rid of. And so the, the consequence of that is that you, if you keep causing these T cells to become activated and they can't get rid of the antigen, you know, un, as opposed to say a virus or something where you can ultimately get rid of the antigen, but if the, if the T cells cannot get rid of that antigen, then it's essentially telling the immune system, hey, there's something wrong, we can't get rid of the antigen, there's no point in con continuing to to become activated by that particular antigen. So one way in which that's controlled is by the fact that once a T cell becomes activated, it upregulates CTLA-4 on the surface, and a signal through B7 uh, through CTLA-4 tells that T cell, all right, enough's enough, you've, you've done enough proliferation, enough activation, let's stop that process, okay? And there's a couple of other pathways we'll talk about later in the course that are involved in that process as well, but it's really preventing this sort of chronic activation of these T cells so they don't keep causing, uh, causing tissue damage, which they can, certainly, they can certainly do. Okay, any, any questions about CTLA-4 or B7 before we move on? Okay. So when we talk about antigen presenting cells, you know, we've heard a couple of examples of that, and we, we call these professional antigen presenting cells because basically, in addition to the other things that they're involved in, they also have the ability to present antigen to T cells. And one of the things that distinguishes these cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells, is that they express on their surface both MHC class one as well as MHC class two, which is, which is important because while almost every nucleated cell can express MHC class one, only these professional antigen presenting cells can express class two. So class two is not all, all over the place throughout the body. It's, it's specifically expressed on these professional antigen presenting cells. So an example of this is a dendritic cell, which can pick up antigen. In this case, uh, there's a, a virus infecting the DC. It can then present that, that viral antigen on the surface of the cell. In this case, would probably be through class one, uh, and then move its way into these T cell areas within the lymph node and then present those to these T cells. Uh, macrophages, which are essentially capable of phagocytosis and getting rid of a lot of um, gunk that's in our system. Uh, an example of that here is it's taken up a bacterium that's present in the extracellular space, takes it up into um, phagocytic vesicle, which is then delivered to a lysosome, breaks that down into peptides, and then ultimately those peptides make their way into class two and that's presented on the surface of this macrophage, which, which makes its way to a, a nearby lymph node to activate a T cell. And then we have B cells, and B cells have obviously, in addition to be, being expressing um, class one and class two on their surface, they also have a B cell receptor, which is antigen specific. And so, as I'll talk about in a minute, they can act as, as really good antigen presenting cells uh, in a couple of perspectives, one of which is that you know, they, they have class one and class two on their surface, they can express B7 on the surface. But on top of that, they are typically specific for the antigen that they present to the T cell. And so you get this collaboration that takes place between a T cell and a B cell that uh, can induce a really strong T cell response. So let's first consider the dendritic cells, which can interact with uh, the T cells. So as I mentioned, these guys can, they're, they're bone marrow derived and they, they can migrate throughout the blood into um, different sites within our tissues, including the skin and, and then our lungs. And when they're immature, which is basically shown over here, 
these cells have on their surface um, molecules like DEC205, which allow them to take up certain microbes. They also have um, class one and class two, but note, and then they have a, a chemokine receptor, CCR4 here. Once they become activated, meaning that they encounter a bacterium, a virus, a fungus, or what have you, they become mature, and so they then make their way into a, a nearby lymph node. They upregulate, they actually increase the expression of class one and class two on the surface, so they're doing a better job at antigen presentation. They've upregulated B71 and B72, so these are these co-stimulatory ligands, and they've upregulated uh, CCR7, which then allows them to migrate um, near T cells. And so the consequence of all this is that they get into the lymph node, they find their way to, uh, to a T cell. These guys actually don't move very quickly. It's the T cells that are really moving around from you know, one dendritic cell to the next, but they're basically doing a really good job presenting antigen. And a T cell comes along, and not only does it recognize that there's peptide that it can, it can bind to, but it also sees these co-stimulatory ligands and says, okay, yeah, there's something really messed up going on here. Macrophages, as I mentioned, can also act as antigen-presenting cells. And in this case here, um, because of the fact that they're just really good at, at phagocytosing things, they can take up bacteria, rapidly uh, process that. They themselves become mature and upregulate B7 on the surface, migrate to a nearby lymph node, and then they can then activate a naive T cell. All right. And then what, one point that I want to make, actually, let's go on real quick to the B cells. So the B cells basically act very similar to uh, dendritic cells and macrophages in the sense that they can, um, you know, they can bind to these antigens. In this case here, they're, they're typically going to be found inside of the lymph nodes themselves. So uh, you need to have antigens that can make their way throughout the blood or lymphatics into the lymph nodes. But at this point, because the B cell has on its surface a B cell receptor that can bind to that, that microbe, the result is that it sort of acts like a vacuum cleaner. It binds to the, to the antigen, does a really good job of taking up a particular antigen and then presenting that to T cells. And so this interaction that takes place uh, similar to before, you get signal one through the T cell receptor binding to peptide antigen, and then you get the costimulatory receptor binding to the ligand, and then you get productive T cell activation. All right, so th the last point I want to make is basically something that we call adjuvant. And this is this idea that if you wanted to induce an immune response, let's say that you wanted to make a vaccine, for example. You want to be able to get T cells that respond to a particular antigen. You, you don't just use the peptide, right? You don't just have the antigen itself. You need to have this innate immune signaling coming on. So adjuvants are, are reagents. Typically, they're killed bacterial cells that you can put in along with a particular antigen and then get a T cell response against that. So an example of this is, let's say you take um, you know, some protein that you want to make an immune response against, like ovalbumin from chickens. Chickens don't normally exist. You know, they don't have ovalbumin in mice, and you want to make a mouse response, a T cell response against ovalbumin. If you just inject that on its own without an adjuvant, the result is that you will get presentation by an antigen presenting cell like a macrophage here. And the result is that the macrophage will eventually find its way to a naive T cell, and, the, and they, they will interact through, their, uh, through these adhesion molecules, but you won't get productive activation of the T cell because while you have the T cell receptor get, becoming activated, you don't have this co-stimulatory receptor, CD28, getting that signal. So the result is that the T cell will not become activated. So if you then come along with your, uh, with your antigen, but you also include some bacteria in the mix, and these can be heat killed or what have you, um, those, those bacteria, by, by having certain uh, PAMPs associated with them, will bind to these macrophages and then ultimately that will lead to the activation of these, these uh, antigen presenting cells and so they upregulate on their surface B7 and so that then will deliver both signal 1 and signal to the T cell and you get productive activation uh, and, and then you get a T cell response. And so if you wanted to make a vaccine, this would be one way that you might want to do that. And then the third example is if this T cell is proliferating, um, and, and one issue here is that it can certainly take up bacterial proteins to present those to these T cells, but it can also take up you know, other antigens. And a good example of that would be self antigens. And so in this case, the T cell is getting stimulated by an activated 
uh, antigen presenting cell, which is presenting um, the appropriate peptides to that T cell so that the T cell receptor can bind. And it's also presenting CD28. But, but you may also have some cells that are slightly under the threshold for self-activation. And because of the fact that they're expressing B7 on their surface and they're presenting some, say, a self-peptide on the surface, you may be able to overcome peripheral tolerance and get T cells that can uh, be autoreactive. And so this is actually thought to be one reason why um, autoimmunity takes place oftentimes as a result of some sort of an infection. There's an environmental component to that as well. And we'll talk about that later when we, when we talk about uh, autoimmunity. All right, so that's, uh, that's it for today. We'll get into more detail about T cell activation next time we meet.